We'll, we'll recognize you now. Thank, Thank you, you. ma'am. Mr. Chairman Pope and honorable members of this committee, I'm Joanna Martin, a retired litigation attorney. Now I speak and write about the original intent of our Constitution. I am here as a concerned citizen and thank you for the invitation. Article 5 provides two methods of amending our Constitution. Congress proposes amendments or calls the convention to propose amendments if two-thirds of the states apply for it. The first method was used for the existing 27 amendments. Congress proposed them and sent them to the states for ratification. Under the second method, Congress calls a convention. We've never had a convention under Article 5. It is dangerous, and James Madison, Alexander Hamilton, four U.S. Supreme Court justices, among others, warned against it. But the globalists have been pushing for a convention for 60 years, ever since the Ford Foundation produced the Constitution for the New States of America. Read this and tremble. In the past, conservatives defeated the periodic pushes for a convention. So the globalists repackaged the push for a convention to appeal to conservatives. They claim the only way to limit the power and jurisdiction of the federal government is to amend our Constitution, and we can only get the amendments which do that at a convention. So let's look at the Constitution they say must be amended to limit the power and jurisdiction of the federal government. With this Constitution, we created a federal republic. It is a federation of sovereign states united under a national government only for those limited purposes enumerated in the Constitution. We listed every power granted to the national government. Most of those powers are listed at Article 1, Section 8, Clauses 1 through 16. All our Constitution authorizes the national government to do over the country at large falls into four categories. One, military defense, international commerce and relations. Two, immigration and naturalization. Three, establish a commercial system with uniform weights and measures, patents and copyrights, money, system based on gold and silver, bankruptcy laws, mail delivery and some road building, and four, with some of the amendments, secure certain civil rights. That's it. All other powers are reserved by the states or the people. So this is a nation only with respect to war and treaties, immigration and naturalization, a uniform commercial system, and a few civil rights. Those are the only purposes for which the states are federated together. This chart, and I have a packet for the members of the committee, lists the federal structure of our government and lists the powers delegated to the federal government. As you see, it's a short list. Ms. Martin, we are staff is coming to get the packet. That way they, they could refer to it as you, during your discussion. Thank you, Thank you very Thank much. Thank you. Sorry to interrupt. Thank you. We are a nation only for the limited purposes listed here. So, it's only with respect to the enumerated powers listed in the Constitution that the federal government has lawful authority. If it's on the list, Congress may make laws about it. But if it's not on the list, Congress usurps power and acts unlawfully when it meddles. Tragically, the knowledge of what I just told you has been forgotten. That's why our federal government turned into Frankenstein. Everybody ignores the Constitution because we didn't know the enumerated powers and didn't care. The federal government was able to usurp thousands of powers not on the list. State and local governments collaborated with the usurpations by taking federal funds to implement unconstitutional federal programs. To claim that these problems can be fixed 
by amending our Constitution makes as much sense as saying that, people, that since people violate the Ten Commandments, God should amend the Ten Commandments. But the Convention of States Project, COS, insists the problem is the Constitution, and we have to amend our Constitution to make the federal government obey it. But the claim that we can control those who ignore the Constitution by amending the Constitution is absurd. Mark Levin and Michael Ferris push for a convention. They say they want amendments to limit the power and jurisdiction of the federal government. So let's look at some of the amendments they proposed. Michael Ferris's parental rights amendment delegates power over children to the federal government. Section 3 says, neither the United States nor any state shall infringe these rights without demonstrating that its governmental interest as applied to the person is of the highest order and not otherwise served. Mark Levin's Liberty Amendments also do the opposite of what he claims. His amendment to limit the federal, federal bureaucracy legalizes what are now unconstitutional federal agencies. Education, energy, agriculture, agriculture, environmental protection, etc., etc., etc. Our Constitution doesn't authorize these agencies. They are not on the list. But Levin's amendment legalizes all such agencies for as long as Congress reauthorizes them. Article 1, Section 1 of our Constitution says only Congress may make laws. But since Woodrow Wilson, our federal agencies have been writing rules, the Code of Federal Regulations. All these rules are unconstitutional as outside the scope of powers delegated and as in violation of Article 1, Section 1. But Levin's amendments to limit the federal bureaucracy legalizes these rules and the rulemaking process for as long as Congress approves them. Levin's amendment to limit federal spending is a knife in the gut of our Constitution. Our Constitution limits federal spending to the enumerated powers. If you go through the Constitution and highlight all the powers delegated to Congress and to the President, you will have a complete list of the objects on which Congress is authorized to spend money. That's how our Constitution controls spending. But everyone ignores it. Levin's amendment substitutes a budget for the enumerated powers and thus legalizes the current practice where Congress spends money on whatever is put in the budget. His amendment thus changes the constitutional standard for spending from whether the object is an enumerated power and creates a completely new constitutional authority to spend on whatever Congress and the President want to spend on. It thus transforms our Constitution from one of enumerated powers only to one of unlimited powers. And while his amendment pretends to impose a limit on the amount of spending, the limit is fictitious because it can be waived whenever Congress votes to waive it. During 2016, COS staged a three-day simulated convention at Williamsburg, Virginia to prove that at a convention called by Congress under Article 5, the delegates would come up with wise amendments to limit the power and jurisdiction of the federal government. And they came up with six amendments, one for term limits. Here are the others. One would make Congress's existing practice of spending on whatever they want constitutional for as long as Congress continues to approve increases in the debt. Another would delegate to the federal government new powers such as I witnessed 45 years ago in communist East Europe and the Soviet Union. It delegates to the federal government 
power over the movement or transportation of persons across state lines. This would provide constitutional authority for the federal government to do such things as require prior approval to cross state lines, require internal passports as in the Soviet Union, establish checkpoints at state borders, and ban use of privately owned vehicles to cross state lines. Under Article 1, Section 1, only Congress may make law but one amendment would elevate to law every order or dictate issued by anyone in the executive branch of the federal government. Another would authorize Congress to impose a national sales tax and a national value added tax. And one would, like Mark Levin, make rulemaking by federal executive agencies constitutional. The delegates to this simulated convention were primarily Republican state legislators invited by COS, and they showed they are constitutionally illiterate, didn't understand what they were doing, and were steered by persons of insidious views who were present at the simulated convention. So, would Ferris's, Levin's, and COS's proposed amendments limit the power and jurisdiction of the federal government? No. They do the opposite. They delegate new powers and legalized powers the feds have already usurped. It is impossible to come up with amendments which do as they promise because there is no amendment on the face of this earth which can stop violations of our Constitution. When the feds usurp powers not delegated and when state and local governments accept federal funds to implement unconstitutional federal programs, all of them are ignoring the existing constitutional limits on federal power. So the claim that we can get amendments to rein in the power and jurisdiction of the federal government is false. There is another agenda. COS says we must amend the Constitution because people in Washington don't understand it. Rubbish. Our Constitution is so simple, Alexander Hamilton said, the people are the natural guardians of the Constitution. If it's on the list, the feds may do it. But if it's not on the list, they can't lawfully do it. For clauses the Supreme Court perverted, interstate commerce, general welfare, and necessary and proper clauses, we don't need a convention to draft amendments showing what those clauses mean. Just look it up in the Federalist Papers. I've already done it. It's on one page. COS's whole case is based on a fabricated George Mason quote. They claim the convention method was added to Article 5 so that when the federal government violates the limits in the Constitution, the states could fix it by amending the Constitution. James Madison kept a journal at the federal convention of 1787. I went through it and pulled out every reference to what became Article 5. None of the delegates said that when the federal government violates the Constitution, the remedy is to amend the Constitution. Madison's journal shows that the framers agreed that the purpose of amendments is to remedy defects in the Constitution. And on June the 11th, 1787, George Mason said, the Constitution now being formed will certainly be defective, as the Articles of Confederation have been found to be. Amendments, therefore, will be necessary. So they discussed the procedures for making amendments. The Articles of Confederation, our first Constitution, provided for amendments to be approved by the Continental Congress and all of the then 13 states. Should the new Constitution also require Congress to approve amendments? Mason said that would be improper because Congress may refuse consent to amendments the people want. 
So this constitution doesn't require Congress to approve amendments. So why was the convention method added to Article 5? Madison wanted Congress to propose amendments on their own or at the request of the states. But Mason said the people should be able to propose amendments without asking Congress to propose them. He said the convention method should be added. Now, Madison knew that our Declaration of Independence recognizes that a people have the self-evident right to throw off one government and set up a new one. And thus, they have the right to meet in convention and draft a new constitution, whether the convention method were in Article 5 or not. So the convention method was added to Article 5, and it provided a way for the people to propose amendments. But it also provided a way to get a new constitution under the pretext of just getting amendments. The anti-federalist at the convention wanted another convention so they could get rid of the Constitution the delegates had just drafted. On August the 31st, 1787, George Mason said he would sooner chop off his right hand than put it to the Constitution as it now stands. And if it weren't changed to suit his views, he wanted another convention. So even before the ink was dry on this Constitution, the anti-federalists were agitating for another convention to get rid of it. And that's why, as early as April 1788, John Jay, who became our first Chief Justice, Alexander Hamilton, James Madison, began warning against another convention. My rescission and brilliant men packets in your flyers lay this all out. COS tells you that Congress has nothing to do with the convention except name the time and place of the initial meeting. They tell you state legislatures will appoint the delegates and control everything they do. But our Constitution doesn't say that. Our Constitution says at Article 5 that Congress calls the convention and at Article 1, Section 8, last clause, that Congress has the power to make the laws necessary and proper to carry out its power to call the convention. So, the April 2014 report of the Congressional Research Service shows that Congress recognizes that it has exclusive authority to set up to call the convention. The report shows that in Congress's preparations for conventions in the past, Congress has shown that it will determine, among other things, the number and selection process for delegates. So Congress can select the delegates, they can select themselves. Congress has also recognized that it has the power to receive, judge, and record state applications. Congress has the power to decide how to count the applications. Congress can aggregate the different flavors of applications and count them together. New York filed an application in 1789. Should it be counted? Pursuant to the necessary and proper clause, Congress has the power to decide all such issues. COS also tells you, again without a shred of evidence, that delegates have no power to do anything except rubber stamp decisions dictated by state legislators. But that also isn't in Article 5. Article 5 doesn't grant to the states any power to control delegates. What Article 5 shows is that 
The only power states have is to ask Congress to call a convention. Once two-thirds of the states have applied and Congress calls the convention, it's out of the state's hands. COS says a convention is safe because three-fourths of the states have to ratify whatever comes out. That's not true. Our Declaration of Independence recognizes the right of the people to alter or abolish their form of government and set up a new government. We invoked that right in 1776 to throw off the British monarchy. In 1787, we threw off our first constitution, the Articles of Confederation, and we set up a new one, this one, which created a new government. How did we get from our first constitution to our second constitution? There was a convention to propose amendments to our first constitution. The Continental Congress resolved on February the 21st, 1787, to call a convention to be held in Philadelphia, quote, for the sole and express purpose of revising the Articles of Confederation. But the delegates ignored this limitation, and they ignored the instructions from their states and they wrote our second constitution. And in Federalist paper number 40 at the 15th paragraph, James Madison invoked that transcendent and precious right of a people to throw off one government and set up a new one as justification for ignoring their instructions and writing a new constitution. You can't stop that from happening at another convention. If we have a convention now, George Washington, James Madison, Ben Franklin, and Alexander Hamilton won't be there. Who will be there? Constitutionally illiterate people such as those who attended the simulated convention and persons of insidious views to steer them to a predetermined outcome, which is almost certainly a third constitution. A third constitution will have its own new mode of ratification. Our first constitution required the Continental Congress and all of the then 13 states to ratify amendments. But our second constitution, drafted at the Amendments Convention of 1787, provided at Article 7 that it would require only nine states for ratification. If we have another convention, nothing can stop delegates from proposing a third constitution with its own new mode of ratification. New constitutions are already prepared. The Constitution for the New States of America is ratified by a national referendum. Whoever controls the voting machines will determine the outcome. The states are dissolved and replaced by regional governments answerable to the, new to the new national government. Under this constitution, we are disarmed. Here is the constitution for the new socialist republic in North America, 100 pages. The Constitution 2020 movement is backed by George Soros. He wants a new constitution in place by the year 2020. They are behind schedule. The North American Union. During 2005, George W. Bush met on his ranch with the PM, the Prime Minister of Canada, and the President of Mexico, and they sketched it out. This is the task force report on the North American Union by the Council on Foreign Relations. It provides for, among other horrors, setting up a parliament over the United States, Canada, and Mexico. This is altogether repugnant to our existing constitution. COS says there's no danger because delegates can be controlled by faithful delegate laws. That's absurd. 
just as state legislatures in the Continental Congress couldn't control the delegates to the Federal Amendments Convention of 1787, they can't control delegates to an Amendments Convention today. Our Declaration of Independence recognizes as a self-evident right the power of a free people to form, modify, or abolish their government. An Article V Convention is a sovereign assembly with government-making and government-changing authority. COS calls it a convention of states, thus creating the false impression that the states control it. But it's a federal convention called by the federal government for the federal purpose of addressing our federal constitution. The delegates would be the sovereign representatives of the people, though in our venal times they would be more likely representing the globalists since they have the cash and are financing the push for an Article V convention. So the delegates can, like James Madison, exercise that right recognized in our Declaration of Independence to throw off the governments we have and write a new constitution which creates a new system of government. And since it will have its own new mode of ratification, it's sure to be approved. Proponents of faithful delegate law say, we will make it a felony to violate state instructions. Well, I started out as a criminal defense lawyer, and I'm telling you, you can't get a conviction of someone who exercises what our Declaration of Independence recognizes as a self-evident right. And it's easy to circumvent faithful delegate laws. On May the 29th, 1787, at our Federal Amendments Convention, the delegates made rules for their proceedings and voted to make the proceedings secret. Delegates to a convention to date can do the same, and they can make it a rule to conduct all voting by secret ballot. The states would never know who did what. And remember, Congress has the power to decide how the delegates are selected. Nothing in the Constitution requires Congress to permit the states to select delegates or even to send delegates. And finally, don't forget governmental immunity. In this country, government officials have sovereign immunity for their official acts. Delegates to a convention would also have immunity. And remember, even if state legislatures could control delegates, so what? There is no amendment which can control governments, federal, state, or local, which ignore the existing constitutional limits on federal power. This is why James Madison, Alexander Hamilton, four U.S. Supreme Court justices and others warned against an Article V convention. My brilliant men flyer quotes what they said and links to where they said it. I implore everyone who supports a convention to read the short flyer and consider this question. Is it possible that James Madison, Alexander Hamilton, Chief Justice John Jay, Justice Arthur Goldberg, Chief Justice Warren Burger, and Justice Antonin Scalia understood something about the plenipotentiary powers of delegates to an Article V convention, which you haven't yet grasped? James Madison warned of violent partisans and individuals of insidious views being at a convention. Are there people like that today? Yes, and they want a convention. But COS says only moral and wise people will be delegates. Let's look at that claim. There are three ways to select delegates. Would Congress appoint moral and wise delegates? Would state governments appoint moral and wise delegates? Would the people elect moral and wise delegates? Moral and wise people haven't been in charge of anything in this country for a hundred years. And now, federal spending. The Pew Report says for fiscal year 2017, 
31.9% of the revenue the South Carolina state government got was from federal funds. And that's a pittance compared to the additional federal money sent into South Carolina to local governments, non-governmental organizations, <coughs> research grants, price support, subsidies, Medicare, Social Security, etc., etc., etc. Informed, rational, and honest people can't rant and rave about how we need a balanced budget amendment to rein in federal spending when we have our hands out for all that federal money. And all that money and the money sent to the other 49 states year in and year out is added to the national debt and most of that spending is unconstitutional. I say let's enforce these and downsize the federal government to its enumerated powers. Ms. Martin, that is uh, 30 minutes. I'm going to stop you just a second if I could. The um, members, uh, hopefully we have some moral and wise members on this committee. We'll, we shall see based on their questions. Do, uh, uh, do, uh, uh, do, any, do, do any members have questions at this point? Yes, sir. Mr. Jones. Yes, sir, Chairman Pope. Um, Ms. Martin, does Article 5 say anything about the rules of a convention? No. No, the delegates, as the sovereign representatives of the people, have the power to make the rules, just as they did at the Federal Amendments Convention of 1787. Gotcha. Did the delegates, any of the delegates in the convention of, of 1787, did they have reservations about the powers that had been granted to them for that convention? Uh, one or two of them did. Uh, uh, on May the 29th, I think they commenced proceedings. They elected the officers, made the rules uh, for their proceedings, and then Mr. Randolph from Virginia introduced his 19 resolutions, which were basically the outline for setting up a completely new government. And a few of the delegates did express reservations, but they were ignored. Most of the delegates agreed that what was needed was a completely new constitution. But fortunately, we had men of virtue and wisdom at that convention. Yeah. Very good. And I think you've answered uh, my other question about the caliber of delegates, the people selected to go to those conventions. Um, do you trust our state legislature that they would send a person that would represent a balanced budget, sound money, um, term limits, uh, those principles? Do, do, do I trust do, this? Do you trust that the state legislator, legislature would be able to select a delegate uh -huh. um, to send to, the, to a convention, a potential convention that would represent um, and stand up for a balanced budget, term limits, um, and those, those kind of amendments? Uh, I think the level of constitutional illiteracy and ignorance in our country today is so vast that we shouldn't be meddling with our Constitution at all. For example, about a, about a balanced budget amendment, that is one of the worst ideas since sin, since our Constitution already lists the objects on which the federal government may spend money. A balanced budget amendment completely changes the constitutional authority for spending. Under the balanced budget amendment, the federal government now can spend on whatever they want. And they have power over whatever they spend money on. We all know that with federal funds comes federal control. Amendments can't solve our problems. No amendment to this Constitution can solve our problems. So basically some of these amendments would legitimize um, unconstitutional, currently things that we're doing that are unconstitutional. Every one of the proposed amendments would legalize what are now unconstitutional actions of the federal government 
or would create new powers, some Stalinist, such as the proposed amendment from the COS Convention, which would grant to the federal government power to control the movement or transportation of persons across state lines. That's a Stalinist type power. Gotcha. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Martin. Thank you. Ms. Martin, a, a quick question, and uh, we have other committee members. I, I hear you saying there's a number of things the feds are doing unconstitutional. I, I remember when I was in law school when uh, they explained how the Commerce Clause could reach all into rural South Carolina just by virtue of the Supreme Court said that it could. That's when they kind of lost me on that one. So, so you're saying these things are unconstitutional, and I don't necessarily disagree. If not this call to try to address it, what is the remedy for where the Supreme Court, because the Supreme Court arguably is the, the ultimate cult, uh, court in the land, or cult, mm -hmm. a court in the land, that may be Freudian. Um, so, so where does, how do we, if we agree, and I didn't ask you to agree, but if yeah. we agree that we have a, a, a federal government that is out of control, uh -huh. Where well, we, is the safeguard? What do we do to address it? Our framers told us exactly what to do. First of all, about the status of the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court was created by Article 3, Section 1. The Supreme Court is thus a creature of the Constitution. The states created the Supreme Court when they ratified the Constitution. So the states have a superior status to the Supreme Court. Now, the Supreme Court, as a creature of the Constitution, is completely subject to its terms. It may not rewrite the document under which it holds is its existence. Now, uh, what did our framers actually tell us to do when the federal government usurps power? Hamilton, Jefferson, and Madison said, since the states created the federal government, they are the final authority on whether their creature has violated the constitutional compact the states made with each other. And when the federal government delegates, it usurps powers not delegated, each state has the natural right to nullify of their own authority all such acts of the federal government. The states are not victims of federal tyranny. They collaborated with usurpations. Here are two examples. Education isn't on the list of enumerated powers, yet states implement harmful federal education programs because they get federal money for it. Gun control isn't on the list, yet Marco Rubio's red flag law would appropriate a hundred million for states and Indian tribes which passes red flag law. Never mind that red flag laws are as unconstitutional as you can get. To stop this kind of usurpation, all the states have to do is say no and don't take the money. So what should states do about unconstitutional dictates from federal courts? Alexander Hamilton points out in Federalist Paper number 78 at the sixth paragraph that the federal courts have no power to enforce their judgments. They must depend on the executive branch to enforce them. Remember checks and balances, separation of powers. The judicial branch issues the judgment. The executive branch enforces it or doesn't enforce it. Was it Andrew Jackson who said, the Supreme Court has made its decision, now let them enforce it. If South Carolina refuses to submit to an unconstitutional Supreme Court opinion, and there have been a great many of them, nothing will happen unless Trump sends in the National Guard to enforce it. You remember Selma, Alabama, during the Eisenhower administration, a federal judge ordered the state to desegregate the schools. The governor of the state said, not doing it. So what happened? The president decided to enforce the court's order, so he sent in the National Guard to enforce it. But if a decision is unconstitutional, a president doesn't have to enforce it, in fact, 
it is his duty to refuse to enforce it if the decision is unconstitutional. That, that would need us to have moral and wise executives yes, too, correct? Yes, yes. Right. And right. also a moral and wise uh, a state attorney general and one with a spine. Because he could go into federal court and say, you have no jurisdiction over this. I don't want to monopolize all the time because it's like law school again. I've got more questions now every time you answer one, but I will. Uh, any other members have uh, questions? Anybody? We've got uh, additional guests. I see um, Mr. Magnuson, Ms. Thayer came. Um, we welcome you all today. And uh, do you guys have any questions? Ms. Martin, we certainly appreciate your time and your information. And uh, again, for me, I think I've got as many questions as I started, but in a different vein. I certainly appreciate your time here today. I'm at your service. Thank you, ma'am. I appreciate it. Thank you.